Hi, welcome to our last meetup before the summer break. Uh, and thank you so much for joining us today. So to explain you the meetup format, we'll have about 45 minutes of talk, uh, followed by approximately 15 minutes of Q&A. So please, please uh, leave your questions in the YouTube chat during the presentation so we can collect them and ask them in the end. So today's meetup is about concept-based explainability in the context of fraud detection. And we will not only have one speaker, but two speakers today. Um, Katerina Blay and Vladimir Balayan are both um, responsible AI researchers at FIDSI. Um, Vladimir recently obtained his master's in analysis and engineering of big data at, Univers at Nova University in Lisbon. Um, his uh, thesis, advised by Pedro Salero and Ludwig Kripal, tackle, tackled the task of providing human interpretable explanations for decision makers in the fraud detection domain. Uh, Katerina has been a key contributor to several projects uh, of the FATE group at FIDSI, namely on model interpretability via concept-based explanations, evaluation of explanations, algorithmic uh, fairness, and also ML governance. She has completed her master's at Institut Superior Technique, Lisboa, and her academic accomplishments were distinguished by the institution with the Maria de Lourdes Pintas Hilk Award. She will start her PhD at University of California, Irvine next fall. So um, without any further ado, uh, let's welcome uh, Vladimir and Katerina. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, Ines, thank you for having us. So, yeah, we will talk about the concept-based explainability challenge and application to fraud detection. Um, and by starting, so uh, deep learning becomes a standard in several uh, do in several domains, critical domains, for instance, healthcare and uh, um, in the financial services, where some wrong decision can lead to severe consequences. Uh, so it's really, um, really important to understand uh, what is the logic behind the deep learning models. Uh, in order to be trust, uh, to have the trust in these uh, deep learning models. So this field of explainable AI emerges to tackle this lack of interpretability in machine learning. However, we are still in very beginning in this explainable AI area uh, because the state-of-the-art methods um, produce really low-level feature attribution explanations that are normally not suited for the non-machine learning ex experts, for instance, for the fraud analyst or uh, those produce the concept-based explanations that are actually more suitable for the uh, decision makers, but they don't work well for the tabular data. So uh, to give some example of how uh, domain experts are reasoning about different um, in, in different domains, for instance, for the fraud analyst, when they're, they are uh, thinking about uh, fraud, they they reason something up, uh, like there is uh, there are multiple shipping addresses in the last hour, so it seems reshipping. If it's reshipping, it's fraud. So from this, we can see that uh, when domain experts are reasoning about some event, they are actually thinking about different concepts and high level representation of these events. So the ideal human interpretable explanation for the domain experts, uh, for the fraud analyst and another domain experts, will provide some high level insights about the model predictions instead of providing some low level representation that uh, the decision maker can uh, cannot be familiar uh, with those uh, low level uh, attributions so the main goal of this work is develop a self explainable neural network that can jointly learn a predictive task and also different associated domain knowledge explanations uh, also uh, we want to develop some kind of taxonomy of the fraud concepts that will be used in these uh, as the explanations uh, for uh, different uh, domain experts uh, also, we want to leverage this uh, human in the loop because all the systems, AI systems, classical AI systems have uh, the human in the loop to make the decision. When we want to collect and um, um, take all this uh, feedback from the human in the loop in order to continuously improving not only the predictive accuracy of the model, but also the explainability of this model. And finally, because there are really lack of different uh, concept annotated data sets, we want to uh, create some kind of uh, weak supervision technique in order to automatically label a lot of data with the concept annotations. 
And the way that uh, this solution uh, could be deployed on the real world fraud detection setting is something like that. So we have the self-explainable model. Then when a new transactions arrive to the model, the model will produce not only the decision, uh, the decision task in this, in this case, what are the probability, what is the probability of some transactions being fraudulent, but also different domain concepts, for instance, uh, the, in case of the fraud detection, it will be different fraud patterns that the uh, domain experts uh, as the fraud analysts are familiar with, for instance, suspicious items or high speed ordering. Then all of this information, the transaction information, the fraud score, and also different uh, explanations or different concepts, uh, fraud analysts can make a decision having all this information. And then we can uh, collect all the feedback uh, about the, the fraud the, the fraud score and the explanations in order to continuously improving this self-explainable model uh, or, and fine-tune this explainable model to be more uh, more specific and to capturing all this reasoning of the domain experts. So now talking about the background and some, some related work. So um, one of the things that I think that um, uh, sometimes lag on the explainability fields is when some new method is proposed, um, the, it, it don't have any specification of what is the persona, what, who will be the end user of this explanation. So uh, for whom we will serve different explanations. So it's really important to, in the first stage, define who will be our um, persona for whom we will uh, develop different uh, explanations. So we can have different uh, personas that will actually interact with the machine learning models, for instance, the human in the loop as the, the fraud analyst or a doctor. Uh, we can have data scientists. So by looking to these two type of, of personas, they have different type of expertise. So for instance, the human in the loop have a lot of deep uh, domain knowledge, but they don't have any machine learning knowledge. And in the other hand, we have data scientists that actually understand a lot of data science and machine learning. Um, and maybe they are not so familiar with different, uh, they don't have much domain expertise. So uh, does it really make sense to uh, have exactly the same type of explanation for those two different personas. For instance, we can uh, say for the fraud analyst that the transaction is suspicious because MCC is something. So uh, this type of, of, uh, of decision maker will basically not understand what is the meaning of this feature. And uh, if they don't understand the meaning of the explanation, they will not be able to make some decision. So uh, the main message here is that uh, the optimal choice of the explanation always depends on the end, uh, end user and end persona. So uh, when we are talking about the interpretability, explainability, it's really important to firstly define what are the requirements, what are the uh, good explanations, or what are the more suitable explanation for the persona. And now, after defining the persona, we can divide uh, the interpretability when we want to build interpretability. So um, we can have, for instance, if we don't have any machine learning model, we also ha can have some kind of interpretability uh, just by trying to understand the data. So for instance, to doing the exploratory data analysis, we are actually uh, taking some insights about the, the data. And it can also be considered as the interpretability. Then we have this type of in-model interpretability when we are trying to impose interpretability in the model architecture. So by changing the, its weights or trying to jointly learn different explanations, for instance, the attention mechanism can also be considered as in-model explanation because it's actually something inside of the model that uh, will produce the explanations. Then we have the post hoc methods that are uh, basically a dominant uh, part of the, the explainable AI field. Uh, there are a lot of different methods, and uh, post by post hoc, we mean that it uh, basically considers some already trained machine learning model, and we are only looking to the inputs and the outputs in order to explain. And in this work, we will focus on the in-model uh, interpretability because we believe that uh, there are a lot of different recent work uh, about the post-hoc explainability and the problems related for the reliability of the post-hoc explanations, uh, the consistency. And we believe that if we are imposing or trying to make the model more transparent by design, it it could be more, more powerful than uh, just looking to the inputs and the outputs of the model. Then we can also divide the uh, different uh, explanations by uh, the type of output that we can actually have. So for instance, for the feature-based explanation, we can have, we present a feature and its contribution to the final score. 
We can also have the example-based explanation, for instance, by presenting some similar example or contrafactual example uh, that is basically we are serving some some example as the explanation. We can also have the model internals that we're basically showing some specific part of architecture of the model, for instance, by inspecting the hidden state of the RNNs or another type uh, of, um, of com architecture components of the model. And finally, we have this uh, more uh, emerging uh, subfield of explainable AI that calls concept-based explanations uh, when we basically trying to provide some high-level insight or some high-level description of something. Uh, and in this work, we are more focused on this type of explanations because we want to uh, decision makers uh, to make uh, better and faster uh, decisions. And at the same time, uh, they don't have uh, any any type of, of, of deep knowledge on uh, to understand, for instance, the feature base or the model internals. They uh, don't know what the gradient means on saliency maps and uh, something like that, especially in the tabular data, where it's really difficult to have some 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 quick explanation about some, some event. And there are a lot of methods libraries uh, already available, and for instance, Lime and Chap can are considered as the state of the art of the, of the current um, of the current um, state of the art of the explainable AI. Um, I, it's my own opinion. I think that uh, those methods uh, are really good, especially the Sharp, because it has some some uh, theoretical fundamentation of the game theory. Um, and, but I think that those methods are really popular because uh, when you're starting to uh, to think about uh, the, the explainability, the first thing that you see is libraries of Sharp and Line because they are really easy to to, to try and really easy to uh, to to get familiar with that. Uh, but there are a lot of different explanations, and the message that that we want to pass here is that uh, there is not only Sharp, Line, and uh, the the anchors and another one. There are a lot of different uh, explanation methods and we really need to try different methods and see what is the more um, more uh, suitable for the end persona and just to give some some example uh, there this is one of the papers that I, I I really like but I don't understand why it's not so famous as the the Lyman chap for instance um, it's called ace uh, automated concept based explanations uh, it can produce uh, not only global, but also the local expon uh, explanations. It's a model specific, and maybe it's one of the reasons why it's not famous as the Lime and Chat, because those are actual agnostic, model agnostic methods. So they uh, basically work for different type of, of machine learning models. Um, and basically what this method does is, uh, in the first stage, it applies a different segmentation of the image. Then we resize each segment to the original uh, size of the image, and then we pass uh, this image to some already pre-trained uh, deep neural networks, for instance, the convolutional network, and then we apply the clustering on some specific part of bottleneck of this neural network, and then by applying the TCAF, that is actually another method that is uh, really famous on the uh, concept-based explainability, and by applying this, uh, this segmentation and uh, applying TCAF, we are actually looking at what are the concepts, and in this context, the concepts are the group of different pixels, and we can serve this or use this type of explanations to the image a different um, um, to different convolutional networks in order to explain them uh, with the concepts. However, there is another method, for instance, of explaining neural network and another ones, but those methods are really uh, tied to the image domain, and it's kind of, of easy to understand why, because when, when we are leading with image domain, uh, with the images, it's really easy to uh, to to get familiar with the concept so we can see uh, the car and then we have the wheels and it's e really easy to uh, to get okay so this is a concept and when we are talking about tabular data when we have a lot of features and different numbers uh, basically we don't actually uh, be sure if there is some concept present so by having this, uh, all these requirements in the mind, uh, to best to our knowledge, there is no state-of-the-art method that can satisfy all these requirements. So being in model produce local explanations, uh, the concept-based local explanation, and also works for the tabular data. So by having all of this in mind, uh, we 
we have this this proposed solution that is ca uh, called uh, jointly learned concept based explanations or Joel. Um, and basically, Joel is a neural network. Uh, it's a neural network based framework jointly learn not only decision making task but also different associated domain knowledge explanations. And the Joel is self explainable model, and by self explainable, we mean that it will incorporate interpretability in its architecture, allowing to produce the decision and also the explanations that are related to this decision. Uh, Joel provides the high level insights about the model's predictions that are very much uh, similar and that are really similar to the domain expert's reasoning because we are actually using different concepts within the domain that we are, um, that we are working. Um, so about the, the architecture. So um, firstly, we have, so if, if we think about some fit, uh, fit, for, uh, fit forward neural network, uh, forget this, this part of explainability, we have a normal uh, fit forward neural network. And then in the end, we have the decision task. And when we are training uh, these, uh, these neural networks, we are basically updating each, each layer um, with respect to this loss. Uh, however, in this uh, context, because we really want to some kind of forcing that the decision layer or decision task will be used these concepts, we basically have another loss function here that is supervised function because we actually have the labels to train this. So uh, we have the same, this narrow network will share uh, the both parameters, uh, so for the both, both tasks. But now we have the loss function that is composed by two different components. The first one is decision task that is uh, normally trained uh, for the feed forward neural networks. But then we also have the explainability task. So uh, the updates, for instance, in this explainability layer will be not only with respect to the decision task, but also for the explainability task. And have this type of hierarchical representation of the neural network, we are expecting that the decision layer will, will be actually using these uh, concept-based explanations that are produced by this explainability layer. And also here, uh, we have uh, some kind of scalarization alpha that basically provides different uh, different weights to the, to, the, to the loss function. So for instance, we can have, uh, for instance, 50-50 or 70-60 for the explainability and only 25 for the decision, and we can play around it. Uh, but now we have, we've, by having this lecture, uh, we force different limitations. So the first one, uh, because we have this decision task and we have really a lot of transactions, a lot, we process a lot of, of data. We actually have a lot of labels for this decision task. So we, it's really high resource. However, for the explainability test, there is really a, a, a low level resource because we don't have uh, the true labels and it's really costly to obtain those labels uh, manually notated each transaction individually because we have millions and millions of transactions and the, the neural networks need a lot of data to be trained. Um, so there we, we, we had some research question like, can uh, we do better than the fully supervised and low resource baseline? Because actually, if we have really small amount of explainability, uh, explainability labels, uh, it will not be, um, uh, be good at explanation because we actually don't have a lot of data. Um, so, and then we also thought about another components of this and basically we find two different challenges. The first one is the label scarcity that I was talking about. So we don't have uh, enough concept labels. And also we have another problem because uh, we are working with two different tasks. So we are now talking, we are now talking about the multitask learning when we have the explainability task and we have decision task. And at the same time, the explainability will influence the decision and the gradients of the decision will influence uh, all the updates for the explainability. So it's really difficult to, uh, to balance and learn uh, the, the, these, uh, these two different tasks at the same time. Um, so two possible possible solutions that we uh, that we try to explore. Uh, so for the label scarcity, we think about the weak supervision that is a very known uh, technique when uh, we don't have enough enough data to train machine learning models. And we thought, can we leverage uh, the domain expertise and already existing components in the human AI system? For instance, the classical system that are present in um, a lot of different uh, classical AI uh, human in the loop uh, systems. And uh, for the multi-task problem, we thought about uh, what if we can um, came up with some 
type of learning strategies in order to deal with these uh, noisy labels or trying to combine the noisy labels and the labels that we can obtain at the really low resources labels or basically using both. So those are the questions that we try to, to answer. And uh, by looking to our workflow, we find two uh, different steps in the pipeline where we can actually try to solve this label scarcity problem and multitask learning problem. So starting by explaining all this workflow. So the first thing, uh, what I was saying, uh, we, we want to provide uh, explanation for the decision makers and the decision makers are domain experts. So the first thing that we really want is uh, to transfer all these domain expertise of some uh, domain expert uh, to some taxonomy. So we can use this taxonomy uh, as the explanation. So the first thing that we we did is talk with the different fraud analysts and define this uh, fraud taxonomy of different concepts. So in our use case, the different explanations or uh, the different concepts on the fraud taxonomy. It's like high-speed ordering when uh, a lot of transactions are done in the in the same uh, in the really short period of time. Suspicious items, for instance, if someone is buying uh, suspicious uh, different suspicious items that uh, will not fit to this to this persona. Some suspicious email, and we also have this type of other fraud when basically the fraud analysts don't know what is the concept or what is the type of concept that is present in some, in some instance. We consider that is basically another uh, representation, another thing that is not uh, that is not uh, explicitly uh, done here. And we have exactly the same reasoning for the legitimate concept, so it's nothing suspicious. Uh, the customer have got history and also have another legit that is basically, if we don't know what is the logic concept, uh, the, the legit concept, we consider that it's other legit concept. Now, talking about the distance supervision uh, pipeline, so how we can, uh, we don't have uh, much data we have a lot of data for the transact for the fraud uh, decision task and we also have different rules so how we can combine all these components in order to have the, the bigger data set so we use this uh, this uh, this technique called distance supervision that is usually used in the NLP domain for instance one of the work that used uh, su 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 uh, that basically have a success uh, to use to apply this distance supervision technique is uh, in the NLP work where they use the emojis in order to, uh, as as a weak supervision for the sentiments because they don't have a lot of uh, uh, sentiment annotated data so they use uh, like a weak signal from the emojis in order to have the bigger data set so in our uh, use case what we use is so we have a lot of unlabeled data that have no concepts and those are millions and millions of transactions. At the same time, we have a different rules uh, in the rule-based system, and also we have the concept taxonomy that we define with these uh, with these uh, domain experts. So what we actually did is uh, this rule to concept mapping. So basically, we map each different rule by its description for different concepts. So for instance, in this case, user try and different cards last week. So it's suspicious customer because it's actually trying different cards, and it's suspicious payment because it's using the 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 card. So by looking to this description and look what are the concepts that are um, similar to those rule description. We have this uh, type of dictionary of rule to concepts mapping, and then we can apply to each unlabeled data, to each unlabeled transaction, we can see what were the rules that were triggered in this, in this description, and then basically obtain this big uh, noisy uh, data set. Yeah, so here we have another example of that. So in the end we will have these noisy labels because we are actually not uh, we are we are not sure about the type of if if it's it's a weak signal because we are not sure if this rule is exactly uh, the same uh, have exactly the same representation as the concept so we call it noisy labels and now i think it will pass to the Katrina. So Katrina will talk more about this, uh, how we train or how we uh, came with different learning strategies. So Katrina, um, it's your turn to talk more to talk about that. Okay, thank you so much, Vladimir. So Vladimir told you how exactly we implemented this, this neural network network to provide explanations. And it's up, it's up to me to tell you how exactly we trained this network and how did we tackle the multitask learning in an attempt to avoid the, the forgetting of one task with respect to the other. And 
So I'm going to explain here the what we exactly propose, how we propose to, to train this. We starting from the beginning, so um, just to recap that we have the decision labels, all the decision labels are, are golden and therefore they are not represented in this picture. What we are representing here in terms of these golden and noisy labels are the, the quality of the explainability labels, so the concepts. And we present here the fully supervision approach where we are only using this super small data set of golden labels to train this model that Vladimir told us earlier in this presentation. And we are using this, I don't know if you see my mouse, okay, you see? So these represent the batches, the training batches, where we have instances, each square can be seen as an instance, so instances composed only of golden explainability labels. So what we propose is uh, what we call a two-stage learning because it's comprised of two stages. And essentially what we will be doing, we have a pre-training stage where we simply train a Joel model with these noisy labels. And um, then after training this base model, we are going to fine tune it using either purely golden batches or mixed batches. And the idea is that with this second stage, we want to improve the performance at the explainability task without deteriorating too much the, the performance at the decision task. Because here, just to remind you, we are using noisy labels for the explainability, but we are using golden labels for the decision task. So what we witness in practice, and we will see further ahead in this presentation, is that we can reach very good results at the decision task and not so good results in the explainability task. And so we had this like uh, second stage to try to improve on that. Then we also figured, okay, so if we have this mixed matching, why not just starting it right from the beginning? Because in the first stage, in this, in this two-stage learning strategy, we were basically training a base model, then we were um, freezing some layers and then fine tuning. So, uh, this has like, a, when you reach to the fine tuning, you are really fixing most of the parameters of the network and that might not be sufficient to learn the best optimal uh, parameters for both tasks. So we tried also this hybrid learning approach where we leave uh, un unfrozen the parameters right from the start of the training. Also, just to mention that with regards to these uh, mixed uh, approaches, uh, we always guarantee that the at least one concept of of the concept one concept of each that Vladimir shown. So he showed fourteen concepts. So we always guarantee that in every batch there's always at least one concept of each of each. Yeah. Okay, going into the last part of our pipeline. So we are going to see. So here in this case, we have our Joel model uh, using the explanations and the decisions. We present these to the fraud analyst in a web page where they are able to see all this information and also corroborate with the data. And the idea is that with these concepts, because they re resemble so much the reasoning of this fraud analyst, you will say, okay, so if I saw this explanation that is suspicious payments, then I only need to check the data referring to suspicious payments. And this should be quick. If we are very good, this should be super fast for the analyst. And that's why we are interested in this type of explanations. And then again, because we are using this web page, the fraud analyst can actually say, okay, so I think this transaction is fraudulent because of this, 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 and concepts. And then we can, because we know exactly what type of explanation we give, get, uh, give and we know the fraud analyst feedback, we can actually match and see if our Joel network was doing a poor job or not, and use this feedback to basically continuously improve the network to produce more um, suited explanations and better in the future. Obviously, this has to do, this has to have some, uh, we can't just do this blindly, we have to have some considerations, but uh, this is not the, the point of this presentation. Okay, so we've seen the architecture, we've seen the pipeline, how exactly um, did we validate this, this network and does it work in practice? What are like the results? 
with no surprise, we picked a use case in a fraud detection setting. Haha. <laughs> And it's basically a payment retailer and has two tasks. So we have a decision task. In this case, it's a binary, binary task that aims to predict whether a given transaction is fraudulent or not. And we also have the explainability task modeled as a multi-label task uh, modeled with 14 concepts, the ones that Vladimir shown before. And um, the goal is to output these high level concepts in a way that is correlated with the decision of the model. So we ideally don't want to make a prediction that the transaction is legitimate and then give an explanation saying, oh, this has suspicious items. And regarding the, the data sets, because this is very important, right? So what are we talking about? How many transactions do we have? So we have the golden decision, which was already available and it didn't cost anything to label. And it has around 6 million transactions, so there's a high availability. Then regarding the noisy explainability labels, we also have a high availability because we use that procedure that Vladimir told us with the distant supervision, and this departed from the same data set where we had these labels. Then we have the golden explainability data set, where, which we basically uh, ask the fraud analysts, domain experts, um, to label, and because it's a very time-consuming task and very costly, uh, we only have uh, 1,300 transactions. Regarding the evaluation metrics, how did we actually evaluate this? So for the decision task, we proceed with a standard procedure, which is to measure fraud recall at the target FPR. So how this goes is, we basically go to the validation matrix or to validation set. We pick, we fix a threshold of 5%. And then we use that to evaluate the, the models in a test set. Or so we use the recall using this threshold in the test set. Then regarding the explainability task, we use a well-known metric at information retrieval called mean average precision, which intuitively just measures on average, how good we are at predicting the concepts for a given transaction. Um, so yeah, just to recap what we are trying here, how we are validating this is just to see if we can do better than just using the full supervision data set on that 1300 uh, transactions data set. So the low availability um, data set. And to do this, we ran some hyperparameter grid for each of the, the learning strategy variants, uh, where we change from the number and dimensions of hidden layers to the learning rate, also the relative importance, so that scalar that Vladimir was telling us about on the, in the loss function. And we do this for two random seeds. So I'm going to show you the results now. And this is for the full supervision approach. So it's the baseline. We just use this small data set and we can immediately see that we have a very poor dec decision task performance. And this would actually be unbearable in practice. We would never <laughs> deploy such a model in production. Uh, but on the other hand, we can see that we have some reasonable results in terms of the explainability task. And you will see why I see reasonable in a bit. But um, this is as expected because we are using the data set annotated by the analysts. And we are expecting that the model is able to produce models that are more alike the reasoning of the analysts. And so we expect higher explainability performance. On the other hand, the decision task performance is very low because we are using uh, I think it's 800 transactions to train. We have that 1.3K transactions, but we have to split in training, validation, and test set. But uh, the thing is that because we have such a small data set, our models are probably just overfitting to this, to this data and are not able to generalize. So just to, to facilitate the comparisons from now on, I'm going to represent here the extremes in terms of both metrics. So of the best solutions, which are these larger um, 
points here, and which are also called Pareto optimal points. And they are the result, the Pareto optimal points of the two runs. So um, just take it uh, in mind. Okay, going into our results. So what exactly were our results? How did we proceed? So we had the two stage learning strategy. We have this first stage where we train base models using only the noisy labels obtained through distance supervision and through the rules. And then we pick the Pareto optimal models from this stage and we are going to apply a, a fine tuning strategy on top. So we are going to freeze the layers and try to improve explainability without deteriorating so much the decision task. Regarding the results for the first stage, here we can see immediately that the explainability task performance reduced to 30%, so from, um, from 54 to 30%. And conversely, we can also see that the decision task performance increased a lot. So uh, we actually almost reach 80% decision task performance. Then we are basically going to take all these models and we are going to run, um, we are going, so we select those which are the Pareto models just to, to have this uh, in mind. And we are going to run another hyperparameter grid on top of those where we are now going to change all also, we are also going to try the freezing and unfreezing of layers, and we actually saw that unfreezing wasn't very good. Also, different batch techniques. So we try both using purely golden labels and also hybrid batching, where we add the percentage of the batch with these uh, golden labels. So here we have the results for both learning strategies uh, as discriminated by the scholar we can see that they actually improve the explainability test and they don't reduce as much the decision task. So these are actually very interesting um, approaches. And if you are comparing exactly with this side, so they are in different scales, so it's not a direct comparison. You can just compare it um, in, this, in this table here. So we can actually see that the, the explainability grew by more than more than doubled. Okay, so the last experiment that, that, that we ran was with this hybrid learning, where we start just from, right from the beginning with this hybrid approach. And here are the results. So definitely, if we, we consider the full supervision approach, it, these results are definitely better than the full supervision approach. Um, they are not so far off in terms of the explainability task. They are also better than the two stage based models in what comes the explainability, but on the, but they are not, uh, they not, do not seem to be better than the, this two stage with fine tuning, uh, at least the results that we had. So putting all this together to facilitate the comparison even more than the table, here we have the yellow models are the full supervision approach. So what we were comparing to initially, the blue line, the blue dots are the two stage and only the base models, the, res the result of pre-training. We have here the hybrid. And we basically conclude that uh, our pre preliminary results seem promising, but we still need to carry on more experiments with more seeds and and more runs, and we want to do this to gain more statistical confidence. We also want to explore the hyperparameters, both a higher creed, so to have a broader exploration of the hyperparameter space, but also the, to further analyze what exactly is making these models locate on this region of the solution space. So is there any recurring pattern that distinguish the models that lie here from the ones that lie here? Um, yeah, and overall, I guess that the conclusions that we can take is that it is possible to have this self-explainable model 
that is able to both generate explanations that are associated with their decision. Uh, the learning strategies that we try do seem to improve over the baseline, um, or well, at least if they don't improve on both objectives, they are able to improve the, the decision task without deteriorating too much the explainability. And because these results are such so much spread across the solution space, we don't think that there's a clear winner based on our experiments and, and it should really depend on the use case and on the business requirements. So if someone prefers some model that deteriorates a bit the decision task, but it is, it is more interpretable for the human in the loop and therefore will allow them to uh, make a profit with that, then it's up to them to decide. Okay, so just to, to finish up, um, to wrap up this presentation, uh, we've seen this idea of concept-based explainability uh, applied to the tabular domain, so transaction fraud, and we've seen in particular a multitask learning approach. But this, proposed, this posed uh, two main challenges that we try to tackle with this work, which have to do with label scarcity and the joint learning of the decision the associated explanations. We propose to tackle those using a weak supervision technique called distance supervision, and we exploited the available off the shelf domain knowledge in form of the rules that were already collected in our data sets, and we use different learning strategies. The main takeaways of this presentation that we would like you to take home is that the explanations should really be tailored to the persona's knowledge and to the task being performed by that persona. So one should not blindly pick line because it gives um, explanations and it's one of the most cited works in explainability. We have really to tailor down this to what are the, the persona's needs and how these explanations actually impact and align with the task being performed. And for that reason, we believe that concept-based explanations are really suitable to domain experts that have to deal with machine learning inform or that have to make decisions inform informed by machine learning models, but that lack machine learning knowledge and have a different reasoning process. And we, our experiment in uh, a real world e-commerce fraud detection data set shows that Joel is actually able to learn both domain concepts and explanations. Um, decent supervision seems to be a good approach to overcome the label scarcity problem, the, although it's a bit noisy, and there is no clear winner learning strategy. And with this, I conclude the presentation and we are available to answer any question there might be. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the talk, uh, Vladimir and Katerina. So I think now we'll move on to questions. We have um, here a question from Luis. Luis asks, I have a question regarding the, the beginning of the talk. Do you uh, performed any comparative study on in-model versus postdoc explainable methods, or or have you read something about it? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the the evaluation of the explainable methods is, uh, as a whole, is uh, another really um, really interesting field subfield of explainable AI because it's really difficult uh, to uh, to evaluate them because we how we will evaluate them. So uh, we can have two different types of, of evaluation. We can have the evaluation based on the user uh, the user defined uh, metrics, for instance, if the user, we can improve the, 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 the decision process of the end user, or we can look just for the stability, for instance, the stability of the explanations if the method is providing the stable explanations and something like that. So it's firstly to, def to exactly uh, define Define what type of uh, of evaluation that we want to perform because explanation can be faithful, explanation can be stable, can be interpretable, but it will not help the end user. 
So it's really need we need to uh, to define exactly that we want to 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 evaluate, and it's really difficult question. We have another paper uh, in this in this evaluation, but we only evaluate the um, the post hoc uh, methods, and maybe we can share the paper uh, after uh, after this this presentation. Uh, we actually evaluate only the post hoc methods because in model methods it's um, you know it's and. and it all also depends on the type of explanation that are shown. So our our evaluation is based on the user. So what we use is the application for the fraud analyst, uh, because we actually want to measure what is the impact of the explanations on the end user. Um, so in this uh, in, in this case, it's um, it's uh, really not easy to choose or to compare directly uh, those uh, those methods. But uh, we didn't have any 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 comparison only on the postdoc methods that we actually have. Okay. And uh, uh, also related to the quality of the explanations, when you deploy such a model, um, you will have uh, the, the fraud analysts uh, giving you some feedbacks on the explanations. Uh, I think you mentioned something during the talk. So, so when, once the model is in uh, production, can you, can you get labels uh, from the fraud analysts so that you can have a, a, um, a larger label data set and not relying so much on weak supervision? Yeah. Go on, go on, Katrina, go on. Yes, exactly, Inish. So during, presenta uh, during deployment or when it is in production, we are expecting to have this continuously labeling and it will be easier in principle because it's just up to them to just say. This can also add up some of some time so when they are, if, especially if they don't uh, agree with the explanation itself. Um, but yeah, that's definitely one of the main things that we are hoping will help to make this, this models better in the future. So in the beginning, we have really to overcome this, this obstacle that is label scarcity, but with, uh, we, by putting in production, we will in principle after a few, days or months we will have a lot of label data and we will, will be using this um, also we would have to be cautious because uh, we would have to do some kind of processing so not all labels would be good so we have yes. to apply some processing on tops yeah. yeah because it's, different dif i'm sorry Nash, just to yeah, complete ahead, what, what katrina yeah. that katrina said because mm -hmm. different end users uh, different uh, fraud analysts have different expertise on field so maybe we can believe more on some fraud analysts and less in another one so we need to have some some kind of of um, of mechanism to clean or to to clean this feedback what katrina was saying yes this makes a lot of sense so moving on to the next question um, from Andre, he asks, how do you actually use the analyst feedback to improve Joel? I guess uh, you've already answered, but uh, I'm not sure if you want to add something. Yeah, it's basically, we call it uh, a fine tuning process. So we have the, those golden labels from the fraud analysts. And then because we train these models with the noisy labels and then we have actual feedback from the fraud analyst we use this actual feedback in order to fine tune uh, the the model so we this is the way that we are using it and in the future uh, of course we want for instance one of the things that we done in in the first paper um we estimate or basically try to filter all the labels uh, by the accuracy of each uh, analyst. So we don't accept all the labels from all the uh, fraud analysts. We filter them by by their accuracy. And this is the, the way that we use this feedback in order to improve the, the model. But how, how do you measure accuracy on the fraud analyst um, annotation? It's basically by... Uh, because we have this UI when they uh, where, where they can uh, uh, decide if transaction is fraudulent or not, and we actually know the true label of of okay. that transaction, so we can measure if they are uh, they are accurate or not on on specific transaction, and then based on that we can filter and use different. Uh, so we we have kind of pool of experts. Uh, pool of experts uh, to accept or decline the labels from those uh, from from those analysts. Right. Um, yeah, and 
I have a question. Um, so when you were talking about phase one and phase two of training, uh, in phase two, you, you are only fine tuning, right? Uh, and do you also fine tune the, the, the layers of the, of the decision of uh, if this transaction is fraud or not? Or do you, do you fine tune the, the layers of explanation and decision or just the layers of explanation? It's uh, it's both of them. So we are actually trying to fine tune. It's we we define it as a hyper parameter because we actually we have this alpha parameter that basically we give more weight to the decision task and more weight to the explainability task. And we also have the parameter to freezing the number of layers. So it basically everything is is like a hyper hyper parameters for for our use case. And we actually try to only uh, fine tune in so only explainability on the decision. Uh, both of them, and we basically combine it in the different ways. It's basically a, a hyperparameters. Um, and, and do you feel that uh, explanations can help you can help your model to be more accurate in uh, predicting whether a transaction is fraudulent or not? Yeah, that's that, that's a really a really good question. And actually, uh, from what we did, so so we had another baseline that is just a, a standard multi label when all the heads are in the same level. So we have all the concepts, and then we have the fraud decision. And when we have this architecture compared with the Joel architecture, we actually achieve better results on the decision task by having this uh, another explainability, uh, explainability or uh, explainability supervision. Uh, and because we are expecting that those concepts are correlated with the fraud, we actually achieve better results uh, on, on the decision task because those concepts are correlated with the fraud label. So, uh, and because we have another uh, loss function in order to make this uh, this more um, to learn actually learn those concepts, we achieve better results uh, when we have so concepts are actually helping uh, to make uh, um, a more accurate decisions. Yeah, and, and did you compare it with a model that only predicts uh, the label, in, and not even predicting any explanation at all? Yeah, and that's another great question. And actually, we are still not getting. Uh, the the same results when we are adding the the explanation because because we are dealing with noisy labels so we have the golden labels for uh, or uh, good labels for the decision task but we actually don't have the big amount of golden labels for the explainability task and because those uh, explainability labels are noisy we are actually not getting as good results as just training the fraud but we are trying to different different um, different approaches uh, in order to overcome this this problem yeah just to, sorry yeah, go on, just go to complement with an example what Vladimir just said so uh, we detected that this this uh, uh, technique that we use the decent supervision when we were depart when we are mapping the rules to the concepts there's uh, high, uh, there are a lot of false positives and it actually happens so that Fraudulent transactions are associated with legitimate concepts and the other way around and concepts that should not co-occur, they are occurring. And these are just an example of, of the noisiness of the data. There can be other hidden noisiness, like even within the suspicious patterns, there can be like two or three that co-occur a lot. Or can also there can also be like, um, two that do not co-occur, but for some reason, someone defined the rules and they were being mapped and they just were used by our system. So it's a really tricky, tricky process there. Of getting the, the weak levels for, for the, um, the explanations, yes. And also this uh, weak supervision also in fact requires a bit of uh, work from annotators or uh, fraud analysts and you, you still have to do this process over time, right? Because if in a new uh, fraud detection pattern appears, you need to maybe redefine your taxonomy or something like that. 
Yeah, we, we need to actually we need to redefine the mapping because if you are adding new concept, we need to run again all the mapping and see if this concept can fit another rule. Uh, but yeah, it's the manual process. But then applying this is automatic because it's a dictionary, so we see all the trivial rules and apply it. But yeah, and there are also another another uh, really relevant uh, relevant thing that we are still uh, trying to explore is uh, imagine that we have those uh, 14 concepts but then some new concept appear so how we can incorporate these new uh, uh, concepts it's also open question and we are still trying to to think how we can in the real time uh, for if the model is deploying how we can understand if there is new concept that appears and it's really challenging and really interesting um, research direction of this work. Yes, for sure. OK, I think we have um, another question uh, from Andre. Um, he asks, I'm not sure if you mentioned what is the baseline recall without explanations at a false positive rate of 5%. Is it viable for the product to lose this recall in order to have explanations? Uh, yeah, I think that the the baseline that we are talking about is super supervised baseline, I guess. And no, it's not it's not uh, available. So, if we have, for instance, a uh, ten percent of uh, recall uh, at five percent uh, of FPR, uh, and we have really good explainability, well, why do we need the explainability if the model is poor? So it's it, it, there is another question that we can discuss a lot. So if we have poor model, why, why we want the explanation in the first place. So um, in, in this in this type of trade-offs, when we have really poor model, uh, we basically don't care about the explanation. We just discard and try to, to, to find another uh, parameters for that. Because you know if we have real poor model, it can have a lot of good explanations. But if the model is poor, we cannot do, do anything about that. Yeah, just to add up that, um, to address the second question, which is, um, what exactly is the value that we must say, or how much are we willing to sacrifice in terms of decision task performance in in a sense that we will gain in explainability? And we do not advocate for any model in specific, so that is really up to the to the our clients. It's not up to us, the research data scientists. But we would say that um, this all involves costs and the decision should be delegated to, to the person, the people that are in charge with this, with the, the actual impacts that this model has in practice. Yeah, so it's more of a product uh, decision. Okay, so uh, moving on to the last question uh, from Luis. He says, if I got it right, there is a data set of explanations, a small data set of annotated concepts. Did you thought of cases where these explanations provided by the analysts are not complete? Um, I, I'm not sure what, what what mean not complete in this, in this sense. So uh, maybe it, it, because we are talking about the multi-label, uh, I think that uh, what Luis want, what Luis is asking here is, for instance, we have three concepts, but analyst says only one concept. I think it's it's what what uh, uh, Luis is, is asking. So for this case, uh, we actually in our experiments we have um, uh, some some kind of overlap data set, and basically it, those are the same transactions that are shown for different analysts. And for those, what we actually do is uh, see what are the concepts that analyst one give, analyst two give, analyst three give, and then we basically join all these concepts because actually, we, if th those analysts are right, and we expect that the reasoning of those analysts is aligned, we can use all this information from from the analyst jointly together from all the analysts. But when we have only one analyst and only uh, annotated by this analyst, we don't have any guarantee that the this transaction is complete, and maybe this is one of the reasons why uh, we have these problems of uh, uh, of not getting the same performance uh, by adding the, the explanations, because yeah, it's humans, and humans all can can be wrong about that. Uh, so yeah, we are expecting that the labels are of the good quality, but we don't have any any measure to actually say okay, these those are complete and those are perfect. So you also have 
examples where you have uh, explanation annotations from different analysts, and then you can combine them or discard if they don't agree. Yeah. So from yeah yeah. So from these all these golden data set that is around one point three k of transactions, uh, we have uh, even smaller. Uh, amount of transactions that are were annotated for the, all the analysts. So what we see, it's called agreement uh, set. So basically what we see is measure how aligned uh, are those analysts in those transactions. And this is one of the measure of completeness of this explana of explanation. And I'm not sure if I answered the Louis question, uh, but yeah. yeah I, think. I think that was it. Um, thank you. Um, so I, I'll, I want to ask a, a last question. Um, does this approach also works for like temporal data sets where you have, you know, an action from, from a customer and then a few months later or days you have another one? Um, how can we have explanations for temporal data sets? Yeah. That's another great question. And we are actually starting uh, the, the new new research uh, of, of but trying to apply uh, this the same mechanism the same uh, not the same architecture but the same reasoning for the recurrent neural networks and there are um, some works uh, that is called meme i guess at, that actually use the concepts for uh, predicting uh, predicting predicting concepts for the sequence uh, data sets uh, but there are small small problem because they don't have any taxonomy they don't have any ground truth of the concept so they actually don't have any control of the explanations or concepts that are produced by this model and uh, yeah it's it's actually we don't have sure how we can implement this on the uh, for the recurrent uh, recurrent domain for the sequence uh, domains because you know the the concept can 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 evolve and we don't know if it exactly the same concept so uh, there will be uh, a lot of uh, challenges and we are actually exploring that that also so all the question that you're asking we are actually trying to tackle all of these because it have a lot of different things that can can be tested and incorporated on in this work Okay, thank you so much. And I'll be looking forward uh, for your next uh, research paper so we can learn more about, you know, recurrent neural networks and explanations. Um, thank you so much, Katerina and Vladimir. And thank you to everyone uh, that came today. Um, we have some uh, links in the video description. So if you'd like to give us your feedback, please do. And if you want to apply for being a, a speaker, uh, you will also have a, a feedback form. And if you want to join us next Monday on our reading group, um, yes, sign up. We just uh, left the URL in the chat. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. And thank we'll you for the you. questions. <laughs> and thank you for the invitation. Yeah, thank you for answering. Um, and I'll see you soon. Bye bye. Bye bye.